Welcome to the final episode of our Ralde podcast series. Now, this initiative is supported by Erasmus Plus with a mission to rethink active learning and distance education. In this last episode, we are focusing on an exciting and increasingly more important topic in the world of education, teaching with video. Alongside me are your guests, Frank and Roger, who have firsthand experiences incorporating video into teaching. They're going to share their approach and their experiences. Now, also in this episode, we will look at the impact of different video formats, but also the balance between information delivery and engagement. We'll talk about the practical aspects of video creation, for example, production challenges or the entire production process. But of course, our experts' insights into how we can use video into teaching and how can it make education more interactive and effective for our students. Now, I'm Tom, I'm your host, and I will be taking a more active role in guiding today's discussion because as a content creator and a science communicator, well, video has been my playing field for the past decade. So I definitely have some thoughts on where we could take education if we just added a little touch of video. Now, if you want to know more about our project and everything that we published, you can visit our website at ralde.eu. You can also go to our YouTube channels for all the different videos that we made at the Ralde project. Now, for the last time, let's welcome Come our guests and hear what made them play around with video. Well, um, classically, of course, we have this this uh, lectures in which uh, we, Roger and I, and other uh, other uh, teachers stand in front of our students and tell them a story. And then COVID came, and then we had to switch. We had to switch from this. Uh, standing in front of this uh, this this this, uh, this audience in the lecture hall, we had to turn into online um, recordings, uh, providing lectures to the to the students. And um, well, initially I thought this is not going to work, but it worked pretty well, and students were quite happy. Um, but they were also a little bit uh, they became a little bit lazy because they didn't want to come to the lecture halls anymore because they had these recordings and they could watch it on a Sunday morning, lazy in their bed with a cup of coffee, uh, go back and forth. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's what we noticed, that the, the attendance in the lecture hall became less and less and less. And then I thought, well, maybe we should um, use this knowledge and change our attitude against lectures. And instead of standing in front of our students and boring them with, uh, with, with a lecture of one and a half hours. Um, maybe we should use this, this, this expertise that we now have with recordings, provide them with uh, recorded lectures and uh, instead use the time in the lecture hall in a totally different way. So instead of just telling them what they probably already know, uh, you, you know that, uh, that the Maastricht, you have this problem-based learning. So the lectures are usually after uh, the students studied everything they needed to know. Then the professor came and explained it again. And for some students, that was really helpful. They were really confident that uh, had this, this professor, they exactly told what they already learned. So they went home and said, well, now we're well prepared for the, uh, for the exam. But that's only 50% of the, the, the students. The other 50%, probably already get bored after 10 minutes because they heard a lot of things that they already knew, they already studied. Um, so I thought, well, maybe we can find a balance between these that we can use on one hand, the recorded lectures for those students who feel the need for this 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 confirmation yeah, for that they, they, they learned the right thing. Well, in the lecture hall, we can do it in a totally different way and make it much more interactive. So actually this is, some kind of a flipped classroom, what we, uh, uh, what I would like to do, eh? and that of instead of telling them the things that they already know, because there we can make these recorded lectures, or we can make these knowledge clips, and whatever what. Well, in the lecture hall itself, we can confront them with actual problems, and uh, in these 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 uh, these lectures, the new type of lectures, maybe we should call it workshops or whatever what, um, we can stimulate them, uh, challenge them by using the knowledge uh, that they already have to solve problems. 
And that was the, the actual, uh, actual idea. And I tried this last year, this, uh, this, this course, and I didn't have to, the, the results and the, the evaluation of the students, but what I heard from them that, that it was, it was uh, accepted well. But this, this, I did the recordings myself. It was a little bit amateuristic. And I think we should make these, these video clips much more attractive. And that's why we need people like you, perhaps. <laughs> But Frank, can I, maybe I can ask a question about that, right? So did you only then um, le record your lecture as you usually have your lecture? Or did you really make knowledge clips, right? Because I, the, the, the ter terminology knowledge clips gives me the impression that you have smaller pieces in which you explain concepts. So what did you actually do? I, I made small knowledge clips. Okay. I went to, to a tutorial room. I had this this old video camera, digital video camera. I had a uh, where I could put it on, and I projected uh, the slides on the on the screen, and I recorded myself. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that yeah. was indeed, uh, so, uh, yeah, like I said, really amateuristic. But it was indeed a little knowledge clips of let's say 15 20 minutes instead of this long lecture of uh, one and a half hours in which you explained everything so i i, I chopped it up uh, the knowledge about uh, the, the cardiovascular system and, and the heart function uh, the blood pressure regulation i, I think I, I recorded three knowledge clips okay okay that's a little bit already i have some thoughts on this um but first i wanted to ask you like do you have any background in video or do you did you just start using this because of for example the pandemic no we we didn't have any experience with that i mean the only record uh, Roger, was it already before the pandemic that all the lectures were recorded i think yeah. uh, it was eh? Because that when was it's a in decision the, by the university, right? That yeah. was not a decision by ourselves. No, no. When it's when it's in the schedule listed as a as a lecture, then by definition it is it is recorded. Um, so, but the, the, this is different uh, than the the recordings we made in the in the pandemic period, because then we really uh, sat in front of our laptops and did the recordings, which was for students much easier because when you record a lecture in the lecture hall sometimes it's difficult to understand or when when lecturers start walking around and do not use this uh, this uh, this microphone walking microphone uh, then students cannot hear what what is being said uh, you cannot use a pointer because you cannot see it when it is uh, when it is recorded so there was there was uh, the, it was already an, 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 a major improvement the record of the, the lectures that we recorded during the, the pandemic. Yeah? So, and that's what we already used also in the, the post pandemic period. But the, the, the comments we, we got from the, from the students that it was sometimes this long lectures and uh, they could not choose and they had to go through it and skip and whatever what. So that's why I thought, well, maybe it's better to make short uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes knowledge clips uh, to explain the basic concepts of the things that I think they should, uh, should know. And then separate it into specific topics per clip. And you can really yeah. structure everything and, and have modules and yeah. So what's really interesting to me is um, for you to know a little bit about my, my background and also the people who are listening or watching this. Um, I studied biology and then marine biology so i do have a scientific background but for a moment afterwards i wanted to become a science communicator like that was the big goal that's also why i started studying science in the first place although really getting a job into science communication and this was almost 10 years ago now um that was very hard because it was all the same people applying for the same job and it's just one of them that just got got lucky and, and got that job and then off to the next uh, next vacancy. Um, but what I really, really uh, remember from that period was that I started talking with, for example, University of Hustle and some other Belgian universities of this idea, why don't we film lectures? But this was before the pandemic, um, a lot of years before the pandemic. So it wasn't really mainstream to, to film lectures in the first place. So that was already, I think, one of the the issues that they had, like, why should we should we record these in the first place? But my whole idea was exactly the same as you're saying, like, record not only the whole lecture, but record maybe smaller clips. So you actually free up a lot of the time that the teacher has to spend on those moments and then um, give the opportunity for other 
other interactive sessions, like what you, I think, call here the workshops. So I, I think it's really interesting that just the mere fact that you're coming up with this and I'm coming up with this in two different periods, two different times. I think that really understates how, how good of a, a format this could be uh, for the teaching experience. That's just and really I, from my if I can add something to that, it's not only the two of you who came, who came up with that idea, but actually there are a lot of teachers already that you can, can look at movies on, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they are, some of them are really popular with our students, right? So if we usually, we ask around, okay, how did you prepare for a certain session? Then a lot of uh, students will say that I, I looked at, uh, for instance, the Ninja Nerd, which is a, a YouTube channel of somebody explaining concepts uh, in biology in, in very small uh, films. Uh, and I, I think wow. it's also very popular uh, for students. These are, these are usually lectures of between 45 minutes and an hour. So okay, that's oh, they really... are long. Okay, these are <laughs> yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's he's great. He's really he's my hero almost. I mean, <laughs> the way he, he can explain things is really uh, fantastic. How he how he does that, and I also recommend it to my students. Eh? So if you really want to uh, to to have an ex an, an very extensive explanation of all the concepts, please watch the the, the YouTube movies from uh, from the Ninja Nerd. And also Khan Academy, yeah, that was already known yeah. for, for, for quite a, quite a, a long time. But I think many students are indeed visual learners at the moment. And they, they do not like to read textbooks. They want to have it presented in a, in a very easy way and, uh, uh, and, and just sit behind the screens and absorb all the information instead of reading it. And, uh, well, and I think we should help them in that way and provide them with uh, knowledge clips uh, at a level that we trust and that we uh, think is it has the, the the right level. This is at a very specific topic, and I can imagine that uh, teachers in other courses have much more specific needs, and then they have to make their own knowledge clips. And I'm trying to convince them; it's not so easy. They're not so easy to convince so far. So, how, how is that experience like when you're trying? Because I've done this myself, and uh, it's sometimes running against the wall um but what are like the um, from the teachers who don't see this really happening like what are the main things that they share like mm. well i i don't think it's really a matter of uh they don't see it but uh it, it it's it's an additional effort uh, i mean they have these lectures and they stand in front of the students and they gave these lectures for five six seven maybe even ten years and now all of a sudden they have to change and sometimes they, then, then they think, well, that takes a lot of time and I don't have that time. Do I get extra teaching hours for that? And I mean, uh, I, I think it's a matter of, of I'm planting the seeds uh, and I'm doing that now for a year. And hopefully now I can uh, have the, the, the plans are hopefully starting to grow. Um, maybe we should also <clears throat> give them some examples. And that's why I hope that the feedback from the students uh, on my knowledge clips and the way I handled it in the lecture hall is, is positive because then I have some some tools eh, to tell them okay hey the students like that they were really they appreciated this way of uh, of teaching and uh, maybe that will convince them that we should do it in a different way indeed like you mentioned the ninja nerd is is, is uh, longer it's 45 minutes one hour maybe right in which he or she he explains items but I think indeed shorter clips would work better because if we also we record our lectures and what you see is when, 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 when students look back at our lectures, we can see what they do in their, when they look back. And we, we for instance, they, they, re, they play off the, the lectures um, three times the speed of a normal lecture, right? And then they go back to normal speed at, at specific spots where they need a little bit more explanation or they go through it very quickly and they stop at, at, uh, at, at some places, go for something to drink and come back. Right. And, and, and if you, have, if you make shorter pitches or small, shorter clips, I think that would work much better because then they will take the time to go through and then they, they take their break and go to this next, uh, to the next 
set, I would say. Yeah, that, that was that was exactly the idea that was behind it. Eh? This the short knowledge clips instead of this long recorded lectures of one and a half hours. Because indeed, what you what you mentioned, you can see what they're doing. They're scrolling uh, to the to the parts that they do not understand. While if you have these these short knowledge clips, they can immediately go to the parts that they do not understand and do not have to. And there, there's no necessity for to also watch the things that that are clear to them. So yeah. they can also save a lot of time. Yeah. I think there's um, uh, two things. One thing before I forget, um, something that I see here a lot is like not having time from the teacher side, right? So like you, to develop this content. I think that is a little bit of an issue of short-term vision versus long-term vision, because in the short term, it's going to take you more time to record this. Yes. Um, although you can prepare yourself to make it a lot shorter if you have a little bit of uh, back knowledge on this on this front. On the other side, the long-term effect is that you're going to spend less time working on the same the teaching sites of these these materials and have more freedom to do other things. So I think that's a, a key misunderstanding that I feel a lot of scientists or a lot of teachers have on this aspect, which is a little bit contradictory because normally this is the thing that the teacher should understand a little bit more, that more things take longer time sometimes to, to see an effect. So on the front of the, the longer clips versus the shorter clips, this is something that's very interesting from my side of view. So um, in the meantime that I step out of science, I've also been a content creator. So that means I've been developing videos, I've been developing podcasts, um, working with photography, all these different types of content and being on YouTube. What I've learned from that is if you have the long form um, clips, and you get all this data because I didn't know you could actually got all this data of students watch here. This is where they skip ahead a little bit. Um, is that through the YouTube platform or is that through the specific platform? To me, that's really interesting because on YouTube, you have this, this really nice visual of retention rate. It's basically the same thing, but you get so much data from that where you can then develop the, the shorter content pieces. So I think these still go hand in hand. You have to develop the long form pieces for them to understand what the micro content could be. You can still um, provide the longer pieces. There are students who actually work better in this way because they want to have, I think like Frank says, to have the whole overview of the course. Like what is everything that we need? And I needed to hear it from the, from the teacher directly. But then you can also uh, service the other students who, who like the more shorter versions. Or sometimes you have learned the whole thing from the, the long form but you're searching for that specific piece that you don't have yet. And that's when you can then uh, go to the, the short form pieces. So what you're yeah. saying, Tom, is a little bit like maybe we should have a look at our long lectures mm -hmm. and then, and then uh, check which parts of the long lectures yes. that the students tend to rewatch, because obviously that is a part that they have difficulty understanding and then yes. maybe build a knowledge clip around those parts uh, of the knowledge. Yes, of course. That's the, um, it's funny because how applicable this is in all these different situations. That's how big YouTubers create a lot of their content. It's they make the long form video, whether that's a vlog or that's a podcast like this, for example, and then they'll go and see where the most engagement is. And then from there, they will create the, the micro clips or the, the knowledge clips in this instance, which will then be shared, for example, on social media. Um, which you can then share with the students or maybe also on other platforms. Like it could also be, for example, a really great tool to promote the course for future students because you can give a little glimpse of what is going to come if you study yeah. this mm -hmm. course. Uh, this is, uh, I think, very important uh, at the, in, in stages where students have to make choices. Uh, mm -hmm. In the, the, the fourth semester, they have to make choices between two courses. And in the, the fifth semester, they even have to, to, to make choices between four different uh, courses. So if we can make this, this advertisement videos uh, in which we can explain to the, the students what to expect and, uh, in, in, in a very attractive way, I think that that would also help them to make the right choice. I think it's also a way to maybe convince universities or like the, the higher end, like the higher up the chain that this is actually not, it's not just for recording video for students. Uh, it has a video can be used in so many different ways, in so many different formats that it's really easy to just use the same clip for multiple purposes. 
So it's a lot of um, money well spent, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, but that's coming from my side, of course. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 anyway, humans are. I, I always say humans are visually orientated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, m video or clips, I think, uh, can give you much more information than than a piece of text. Of course, you can have a very detailed piece of text, but then maybe you have to read it three or four times before you understand what is meant. Whereas when you show, a, for instance, a pathway or a mechanism or whatever, yeah. and then then it, it's it, it's coming it's coming to life, I would say, and that's much more appealing, I would say, to especially younger students uh, than uh, than than what is in a book. Yeah, you can you can guide them. Eh? I mean, the, uh, especially in a, in a difficult scheme, uh, you can take them by the hand and guide them through the to the whole process, to the whole scheme, and that is much more easy for them to understand then than when they have to figure it out themselves because sometimes these these schemes of or figures or whatever what are quite quite complex and with these uh, in these videos you can really help them and explain them what every step means and and why it is important can i ask you frank um in regards to the, the knowledge tips you made or the the shorter videos you made so far not specifically the gear that you use but like what was the format of you recording was that you <laughs> sitting no it's just for me to understand like what's been done already because i can literally i can see so many different formats happening right now of what is possible but of course not all formats are created equally um, and some can take a lot more time than others whereas others might be better in transferring knowledge but they might also cost a lot more to produce um so how did you record the setup and um, what was going on in those videos? Cost, zero. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good way. That's a good way. It's, it's, it's what they call a MCP, right? A minimum viable product. <laughs> no, I, like I said, I mean, uh, I, I went to one of our tutorial rooms uh, on, a, on a Wednesday afternoon, a Wednesday evening even, when everybody was, was gone and, and the university was almost completely quiet uh, and i had this this tripod i mounted my uh, my video camera uh, and i has, has started the recording on the on the screen and i went to the screen and i i, I did the lecture but then uh, re while recording myself so it was really really uh, amateuristic so to say but when it's i watched it back it's amateuristic so it's you so <clears throat> if i have it right you were doing the lecture from the slides directly so you yeah. still saw the slides they can be shared and then you have your body your face on there and you're explaining what's happening and you can it, still move around a little bit more than it just uh, it was yeah. it was it was like giving a lecture but then uh yeah in in, in a very short uh, short form uh, for only mm -hmm. 15 or 20 minutes or so but i, I still could use my slides uh, i could say okay look here and uh uh, because I was standing in front of the screen. The only thing I, I had to be care of, be aware of that I would not stand in front of the screen so they could not see the screen. But I think it, it, it worked pretty well. But yeah, it was homemade, really homemade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, maybe I can, I can point that question back to you, right? So you are much more experienced in, 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 in video and, and recordings. What would you advise us as teachers? What type of video to use, setup, etc. Um, so, so what, what is your opinion about this? I have a lot of opinions about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, please I, share. I think, I think <laughs> if we if we can if we can make it a little more, a little bit more flashy and a little bit more professional. Yeah. I mean, Roger, no. Roger, we have this we have this uh, uh, this course three oh four. Yeah, in which also the students have to make videos in which they explain the specific techniques to their peers. And uh, I attended the, the, when they had to show these uh, this videos and I was already quite impressed by the quality. I mean, it was 10 times, 100 times better than my uh, amateuristic video that I, I recorded. So uh, I think video FHML, they also have to, the, the, the possibility to create these uh, these more flashy videos and uh, well maybe we should should ask them or maybe tom i don't know <laughs> depends a little bit what i'm thinking about is the law of diminishing returns right you can go really high end in production value here but there's going to be a point where you're going to be spending more a you're going to spend more resources whether that's time or whether that's money on recording these clips um 
and you don't really specifically see uh, an uptake in knowledge by the students. So I think one of the best things to start doing here is to teach teachers. It's a little bit the other way around, but to teach teachers how to do this either by themselves or in a smaller team that will do it for them, but so that they have the, um, the, the media literacy to understand what needs to be done. And you doing that, and that's why I asked what the setup was, like just that a very minimum, uh, minimal setup can already be enough to, to spark that, that wave of change that we need in, in this regard. When it comes to really specific things, for example, if you're doing like a whole scheme or explaining like a really difficult, complex idea, I think animation is something that makes it really, really easy to understand for the, the student perspective. But I've been into in video production long enough that I know uh, animations can be really, really costly, especially if they're uh, tailor made for that specific thing that you have in mind. So there's an animator that comes in. Um, if you have like really difficult things, there's a lot of um, thinking about pre-production before they actually do the animation. So it can become really costly to just produce a few few animations. So would, that would, means, AI, would AI help uh, in making these animations? I think we're not there yet for animations. However, when it comes to, for example, um, specific visuals that you need for slides, I think it can already be a lot easier. Like, this is what a lot of people say, like, the AI is, is taking away jobs. I think it's just, it's making it easier to do the same jobs in just smaller teams. I think that's really interesting for me, for example, um, I am a content creator. I do a lot of things all at the same time. So for me, it's really easy now to switch between all these different parts of my job because there's somebody, there's like that assistant who is doing that for me. And I think that role um, of AI can be the same for teachers developing courses like this. For example, now you're starting to see where you can just ask, hey, can you help me develop um, a structure for this course, for example, and you can give in the entire material. Actually, this is where you can give that video link. So if you can upload the same video, for example, on YouTube, you get the entire transcript. From that transcript, you can ask, uh, you can already pinpoint these are the different um, knowledge parts that students want more information on because you have that from your data. You can then ask, okay, then um, these and these parts are really interesting for me now to create a new video on a knowledge clip. Take this um, and give me a structure of how I could make this into a specific separate video. And that's already something that is going to take a lot of work to thinking behind it um, and make you as a teacher get into the creation mode a lot quicker. That's a little bit of that advice. I don't know if that helps or not. Um, it's still going to be work, of course. Yeah. And I think a lot has to do, what I just mentioned, is the media literacy of, of teachers. If you don't know how to specifically, uh, if people are still having issues with Zoom, they're not going to be recording video. That's as easy as it is. Maybe, maybe we should show them some examples for what is possible. Mm -hmm. Then then it makes it more vivid for them to, to have that it comes to life. And then they maybe they say, wow, uh, hey, okay, that's, that's nice. Uh, that's what I want too. And some of them will never enter that stage, I, I, I think. But uh, they also uh, don't have to, right? Not <laughs> no, everybody no, no, has no, to no. do it the same yeah. way. But if we can already show them what is possible uh, with with uh, even a little effort, that could help them to uh, to 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 take the step and 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 go into this uh, making of this these these clips. But I think it's more than just um, making that, that small knowledge clip, right? Because next to the knowledge clip, which the students will probably watch at home as preparation, um, but then you still have your lecture, right? Um, maybe you don't use it anymore as a lecture, but then as Frank already said, you can use it maybe as a workshop and then you, you can di di dive deeper into the subject compared to when you give a traditional lecture, right? Because in a traditional lecture, you have to explain to the students what they need to know, right? Um, but then in, in, in this case, you can assume that this knowledge is already there, right? So then you can go into much more complex problems and discuss those with the students. And, and, and there, I think there is also 
a lot of possibilities uh, to make that interactive with the students, right? So because in the past and also knowledge clips, they are still one way direction, right? So you present and the student is absorbing, uh, but then if you then give those knowledge clips and then you have your workshop and then you can make that really interactive and that makes yeah. the teaching fun, I think, right? And there was a lot of, a lot of, Uh, this is the principle of the flip classroom, eh? in yep. which the students come prepared and then use the knowledge during these, these workshop lectures or whatever you call it. And uh, I think the most people who give these lectures are also expert on the specific field. And that means that they also do research in the specific field. And when they do research, they can use their own data, their own experiments that they have done, show the, the, the results and ask the students with the knowledge they have obtained during the PBL sessions, as well as the knowledge clip to explain these, uh, these data, whether they can come up with a, with a, with a, uh, conclusion, uh, maybe come up to next uh, set of experiments. Uh, cause this is what we also expect from them uh, in the, in the, in the exams. Eh? I mean, we ask them some, uh, really reproductive learning, but also to use this, uh, this knowledge, and particularly in, in, in the master. In the master, we, we give them a figure from a, from a paper and say, okay, what does this mean? But you can already, and then uh, when they are not used to that, they all, always come to you and say, hey, I, I did not expect this. But if you use the, say, the same concept in these workshops, then they get, get used to it, to, to the principle. And that also makes it much more easy for them to uh, pass the exams. But indeed, it, it, it takes some, some effort from the, from the lecturers to prepare a new lecture. But on the other hand, I think if, if you can use your own experiments, the, own, the, 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 the things that you really like, that, uh, that, that, that you dedicated your life to, so to say, <laughs> I think then it's, no, but it's true, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then it also, that, that it makes it much more fun to engage with the, with the students and to, to use these tools. I, I also use these, these book lab tools in my lectures just to, 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 to tickle them a little bit, eh? to give them a question. And you see that they interact with each other because they want to give the right answer. And that makes, that's, that's what it really makes fun. Yeah. I think it also, for you as a teacher, it becomes more fun to, to teach because if you're sitting, I don't know, like I'm not a teacher side, but I can imagine always giving the same lecture to a big group, like a big audience that isn't really interactive and they're just sitting there and you're seeing them pick up their phones and like not being interested in what you're saying versus you don't have to deal with that because that part is being recorded. You know that they will go through that material and then you get that hands-on experience. It's like directly interacting with them. I think that's a more fun way to teach because you can see the progress that the, that the students are, are getting or not getting and that also gives you some feedback of where do i need to improve a little bit more on during the the workshops yeah, and if you if you get to if you have to give a lecture in front of 200 or 250 students then it's already a little bit more difficult to uh, to, to have this interaction but uh, at the later phase of the, the program uh, the, the 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 groups become smaller and then you can have much more interaction uh, mm -hmm. and 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 really engage them and really tickle them and try to pull them into your into your story and then it becomes much more uh, uh, satisfying for both I think at the end and also as a teacher I think what, what it also gives you is more or less immediate feedback right so you as a, if you give a traditional lecture um, you, you 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 give your message and and then you hope that the message you bring, lands at the, with the students, right? Um, online, it was even worse because people switched off their cameras and you were talking towards a black, uh, a black screen, more or less. Uh, so you don't know, you don't get any feedback from the students or not enough feedback from the students to say, okay, my message is clear. Whereas now, if you make it more interactive, you can get much more feedback on what is the knowledge should, should we, should I address something in more detail? Right. So that, that also gives, uh, I think it makes you a better teacher as well. I mean, th that's why you use this book lab. Eh? You ask a question and if you get a, a, an 80% 
students who give the right answer, you know uh, that that they understand. If you have a, a, a that twenty five percent goes to all four different uh, answers, then you know you have to explain this a little bit more, and then you can address that immediately and explain it uh, on the spot, and that that really helps. But what I'm really interested in here is um, what you say. Like I use the slides to present next to me while I'm giving this lecture. Um, the the advantage of using video, I think, is that you give that temporal uh, dimension to to the to the whole aspect of teaching. So, for example, um, we did together with Roger. I, I made some video protocols where you also uh, had to do with some voiceover. So that was a very interesting time, if you remember that, Roger. Yeah, no, um, oh, that was some time ago. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so, so that's where we got from just a normal scientific protocol. Then you could, for example, just put that into slides and share like this are the different steps you need to take. But we went into the video mode of actually showing all the handlings, everything that needed to be done. So by using the video instead of just one slide, which you just use for a, a longer time, you could actually show a lot more information in the same time frame. So um, yeah, but that is that is I think it's a difference between if you'd give a lecture, you are transferring um, uh, uh, knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, it was transferring skills. Right? Because although although it was not hands-on training, but mm -hmm. you did show, we did show in this video, we did show how should you handle this, right? It was an experiment that we did and we filmed the actual experiment. And then you show the student how you should do it, right? So it's much more skills than, than knowledge, I would say. And then you can use voiceovers uh, that, that give more details. Is this what they do, for instance, in this uh, 304 course? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, so they, they also, they have a protocol. Uh, the students have a protocol and then they have to explain that protocol in a video. Um, and, and yes, some do that also with voiceover and they show the handlings themselves because that's, it's, it's again, showing it is much more informative than explaining it uh, in, 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 in text. Both things can really apply, but it, it really comes down to the engagement that you want the students to have. Um, something that I've been really involved in the past few years is studying other YouTubers and how they create their videos. So for me, I've been really in this uh, rabbit hole of figuring out structure of videos. How do you structure a video to make it as informing and as and entertaining as well at the same time as possible for the students or the watch the viewer to to really watch till the end like the last click that's what you want last second um and this is where i don't know if you know a little bit about film terms you have the terms a roll and b roll just to explain for listeners that also don't know a roll is the part where you're sitting in front of the camera and you're doing your teaching or you're doing your talking it's what they call the talking head right so it's somebody who is talking in front of the camera that's where you get all the information that's where you transfer the knowledge part. It's the voiceover, it's all of that. Um, on the other side, you have the B-roll, and that's everything that makes the shot look nice and entertaining. Or um, they also call it inserts. It's what you insert in between the talking head parts. But this is what I think could be that added, um, added value when it comes to these knowledge clips. Is For example, you can still be talking, uh, put the, use the clip of you talking about your topic, but then use something you filmed separately, uh, maybe the experiment. You can put that on top of that block of, uh, of footage that you have already. So you can play with the d different levels of, um, of video. Yeah, that's exactly where we need you. That's, yeah. that's where we need you. <laughs> yeah, that's what, I, what I, I agree with Frank, right? So we are not trained to make, mm -hmm. to make things appealing, right? Whereas somebody who is used to making content, making films, etc. You are used to and you don't you know the the tricks to make it more appealing for for young students. Whereas yeah, we are just used to, let's say, old fashioned way, standing in front of our slides <laughs> and presenting, right? And of course we can try things. Um, but if if there is somebody with with the knowledge how to do it, I think that, that would really help us help us out. <laughs> Maybe uh, to throw a curveball on this is um, 
is this something that you would want more knowledge on on how to do or do you feel that this is something that there should be a separate person on to do that for the teacher because like we of course have a little bit of a connection and we've worked on this project so it's easy for me to step in and say hey i can help you but if somebody is on the other side of the podcast is listening to this and they don't have any direct um, connection with somebody that's a professional it could be interesting for them to know who is that person to look for and should I let them teach me to do this or should I just go strictly to that person? I don't know what you, how you feel about this. It, it, to be honest, I think it comes down to budget. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, well, so that's also if, important if to I think ask about. you, Tom, you will, mm-hmm. if I ask you to make a, a movie for us, you will, you will say, okay, I can do that, but I don't do that for free, right? Because I will put in my time, I will put in my knowledge and, and that will cost money. Right. Uh, whereas if I would say, OK, tell me what to do, that's quicker and then I can do it myself, but maybe less professional. Uh, yeah, but so on the other end. I think it's it's a middle mm-hmm. bit. It, the truth is maybe somewhere in the middle. Yeah, but maybe you are willing to learn this. But I don't think that all teachers will uh, will will be willing to uh, to 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 spend time uh, learning this this tricks and this uh, to, to make these fancy videos. So, um, yeah. It's, it's a little bit where you, in which direction you want to go. And indeed, what you mentioned, budget. I, w- I would really love to. I mean, uh, to, to make it more flashy and not this amateuristic movie that I, I made now myself, but to make it, uh, as I already mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of our uh, conversation, to make it a little bit more appealing and a little bit, a little bit more attractive, a little bit more flashy, and some, uh, to insert some, some more uh, animations and whatever what. And yeah, that, 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 that costs money. And I really understand that that might be the limiting factor, but. It would be really nice, and if we can uh, produce some of these uh, these clips at at a, at a higher level, like I said, I think we can also convince uh, our fellow uh, teachers that it, it 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 might work, that it might be also for them interesting to to make this uh, this knowledge clips. Should that be the bottom up approach, or should that be the top down approach? As in, do we convince the the teachers, or do we convince the universities or the the decision makers? to then make sure that there's also according like enough funding for this or time to record this like what's the what's the best approach here well first i think you need to convince the teachers that it has added value because if they are not motivated to do it then it will not work um and we can only uh, convince them i think by showing that it works that students appreciate it and then we can go to the to the university and maybe ask for some additional budget innovation budget uh, to uh, to create these uh, these videos I, I don't know how you look at it Roger. yeah I, I and i think if you want to convince a university you also have to show it works right so i i think it's a, a meet in the middle approach where you first have to convince the teachers to use it and if you then show it really works, because you can also reach, as I said, more depth in the in the workshops that you have afterwards instead of a lecture. Um, if you then show it really works, then I hope that the the university will say, "Hey, you are doing something which is intriguing. You are doing something which is good for our educational program," and maybe then they can 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 give you some su- additional support for that. Right. So I I, I think. We should start at the bottom and then hopefully we can get the top, uh, we can convince the top and then we meet in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Sandwich technique. Sandwich yeah. technique, yeah. <laughs> yes, and and maybe I'm, we should also convince the students, right? So uh, um, if, if... I think the students stu- are mostly convinced already of, of this approach. Um, yeah, yeah, but if they, if they give the message to the university, hey, listen... We have a teacher here who's doing a lot of video and, 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 and we really like that. That's also convincing then for, for the university, I would say. But uh, it's not only the video, eh? it's also the, the, the extra time that you get in the lecture hall to present them with a totally different approach that they will, that you will challenge them a little bit and think at a different level than only absorbing the knowledge from a teacher that tells them everything they already know. So that I think we should also emphasize that. Yeah, I, I think that is the 
in my view, that's the biggest advantage of the whole <laughs> video idea and the, the, and, and the knowledge clips, because then you can ask students to prepare using those video clips. And then you have more time in the lecture hall where you can go much more into depth, have discussions and, 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 and yeah, so that yeah. students not only have knowledge, but can also apply the knowledge. Uh, and, and I think that's a really, uh, that's really a lot of, uh, uh, this is really important for scientists, I would say, young scientists. I think like it could be interesting to just have it as a pilot study that comes from within the university itself, where they give like one course or one project the chance to develop the material and to to really give the time also to do it well, and then that's where you get your data from to see if it works with the students or not. Um, a little bit like Frank's doing, but then with a little bit of maybe added support by the university. I think uh, that's the perfect way to start this and. Whether you're in the Netherlands, whether you're in Bolivia, whether you're wherever you are in the world, like that could be a way to to get this this thing started. Now, I'm to have a nice clip that works well. Uh, we should also be open to share that with others, right? So I think it's yes. it's not that if Master University makes a movie and then it's just for Master University, I think that's a little bit uh, short sighted. Uh, I think we should also make sure that this is common ground. Everybody can use uh, the information, and uh, that would that would really uh, I would really love to see that. We become the new ninja, the new ninja nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I would want to turn to Frank to Frank here. Um, do you have any questions for me when it comes to um, to developing the video content? Not only just the way that you did it, but like if you're like. I want to do this next year again. Like, how? What are some things that you feel like you you could have some help with? Or yeah, you know, you know, that's that's a little bit difficult to say because uh, I, I don't know what is actually possible. I mean, mm -hmm. if you could provide me with some 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 examples of uh, what, what you what you can do, and then maybe we can sit together and see if we can if we can merge these uh, the, the things that I have in mind and the things you can offer. Because that would would be really uh, nice to 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 see. Because it's 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 really difficult for me. I'm I'm not a video creator, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I can give a lecture and I can can play around with with students in the lecture hall, but I don't know how to to make this uh, this this appealing videos. So then we have to, this to sit is a, together. This is a little bit of that of that student issue of them not knowing all the things, all the materials that are out there to to see like what is the overarching umbrella, of course. Mm. So I think this is this might yeah. actually be interesting from more science communicators kind of view of also teaching teachers how to integrate these all these different formats. Because yeah. um, for example, I think, I think there is a lot to to gain in, in terms of science communication and, and not only for, for the, the topics we discussed now, mm -hmm. uh, had to, to create content for, uh, for, for students, but also in general. I mean, uh, if you go back to the COVID period, the, the, the communication from scientists to the general public was lousy. It was really lousy. I mean, there were a lot of miscommunication because uh, we could not explain it in a way that it was understandable for the for the general public and here we we have to do it in the same way the, the the we are experts in a specific field but we have to present it to students in a way that they can understand it and that's not always easy it's funny that you mentioned that because we had a lot of conversation about that as well um with me and Roger, with other people other scientists um but I think still the the fact of science communication and the teaching aspect with video, it uses a lot of the same skills and a lot of the same methodology to get that information across. It's just, first of all, understanding who your audience is in front of you and, and adapting the way that you communicate to that audience. And that's why video works so well for students nowadays. Like Roger started off in the beginning, and I think you too, Frank, because they like new and more um, shorter content that's now really interesting for the students. But there m might be a time that we actually go back to longer format videos because that's what works for students in that way. So you have to constantly adapt what works with the the engagement in that time. And um, yeah, if we wanted to talk about science communication, we could do another podcast. Um, <laughs> that's the thing what I'm working on right now. And and 
what I have to say just about that part is that it comes back to the media and literacy of a lot of uh, a lot of scientists. Like we can look at the outside and and say like the common man it's the, it's their fault they don't understand science but actually i think it's it's the the issue of teachers and not only teachers the scientists are not knowing how to talk about science to a non-science crowd i think it's a very underestimated job that still doesn't get a lot absolutely. of recognition absolutely. recognition um they're going to need a lot more of Okay, I have just one last question, maybe for Frank, um, maybe also for Roger, because Roger, uh, you've been involved in quite a lot of filming through my <laughs> doing. Like, I'm always taking Roger and like putting him in front of the camera, like, hey, you're good at talking, I'm going to film you. Um, what would you see as some, some really valuable tips that you can give uh, other teachers who are now starting their first thoughts of, hmm, maybe we should dabble a little bit into into video like how do you what would you say to them no i think i think they really have to to identify the basic concepts of the things that they that they uh, want the students to learn don't make it too complex don't put too much information in it just make it concise and clear this is the the the, the maybe i have three or four general themes no not general specific themes that I explained during my lecture, and I will now extract this from this lecture and make a really concise and clear video clip that uh, that uh, that is really easy to digest for uh, for students. And don't lose yourself in details. Eh? Don't lose yourself in details. Keep it keep it simple. <laughs> this uh, the eighty to twenty percent rule, right? Eighty uh, percent of the work is in the last twenty percent to get everything done. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. <laughs> I think one of the things that I learned a lot from communicating with other teachers about this is maybe also understanding what the production process looks like. Because uh, I've been really, I've been doing this for quite a long time and I really understand what are all the different steps that are involved into creating a video. I think that can sometimes be a little bit overlooked and think of like, I have my phone, uh, let's, let's record a video and that's it. Um, so understanding there's a pre-production phase the, the ideation, like how do we, what do we want to do, the planning, what are you going to write down? And then afterwards, the production phase is where you film, which is actually the shortest phase of them all, like the most time you should be spending in your pre-production to get everything as smooth as possible. And then the post-production phase is like how you edit everything together. You can go from really easy steps of not editing and just using your clip to putting like weeks on end into the editing bay if that's something to do so there are a lot of um there's a big spectrum in between these two things and knowing how much of a production quality you want i think that also allows you to understand okay i need to maybe learn a little bit from this and you may need to learn a little bit from this and then you just you practice it's um in the creator world we call it uh, putting in your ten thousand hours like it's, it takes a lot of time to really do it well but the more you practice, the easier it becomes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, but we, we we should try to find a, a nice balance. I mean, it should not. Mm -hmm. We should not go for an Oscar nomination, right? No, of I mean. course. <laughs> that's uh, but, that's yeah. for the production. <laughs> that's for the video producer side. No, I, I'm not going for the Oscar, Frank. <laughs> Maybe Emmy, Emmy, that would be something. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't have said it any better. So thank you for tuning in to our discussion on teaching with video. If you want to reach out to our guests, please refer to the podcast description. And also be sure to check out the other episodes on virtual reality and problem-based learning if you haven't already. And of course, you can visit the Ralde.eu website to learn a little bit more about the Ralde project and everything that we published. But you can also go and watch our videos at the Ralde project on YouTube. And with that, the entire project is coming to an end. We learned so much in the past few years. So I want to thank you also for being here and listening to all of these episodes. Hopefully I will see you again someplace soon. So definitely reach out if you want to learn something more. That's it for now. And I want to wish you good luck with your teaching.